It's a beautiful day in this neighborhood. A beautiful day for a neighbor. <laughs> Thought I'd put my uh, Mr. Rogers, uh, not the same color, but close enough. Uh, sweater I'm going to talk to. I don't have shoes to change into. I'm just not that coordinated in the time frame we have. So, oh man, man, thank you. Thank you for being here. I hope, I know for me, the encounter with the Lord was already here. Yeah, the purpose of why we gather, I know Kirsten, Kirsten probably said it was to hear from and to speak to God. That's why we gather. It's not a check mark. It's not something we're supposed to do to be a good person to come to church on Sunday morning. It is an opportunity that we carve out the beginning of the week to hear from and to speak to God. And I know that sitting back there, man, I heard God speak to me of the love he has for me, regardless of where I'm at and the struggles I have and how short I fall in my life. His love for me is great. I want to start before we start. I want to give a shout out. Thank you. I know you met John and Annette and they were the volunteers of the week. Uh, man, we are starting phase two of getting things started in our space and that's upstairs. And John and Annette work tirelessly all week long up to 11 p.m. almost every night here. And many of you came out and helped us do what probably would have taken more than one week to do and finish all of our, uh, our studs and all of our framing for upstairs. And this is, the, this is the vision of where we're going. God has given us both floors and we're getting the second floor ready so we can have children ministry and, and preschool ministry and have our offices upstairs and we can expand this space. So if you're new or don't like sitting right elbow to elbow somebody, we have a little room. We're going to expand this space downstairs. Just put this in the back of your head and next month, couple months, we're going to go to two gathering. We're going to talk more about about what that looks like and just invite you to participate in helping launch the second gathering. So we'll talk more about that soon. But uh, Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood, uh, we watched the movie last night just seeing his story and just who he was. And it's been kind of the inspiration of our theme about my neighbor. Mr. Rogers was famous for asking this question, Won't you, would you be mine? Could you be mine? Won't you be my neighbor? And it, it, he said that because of the, that question really revealed the heart of who he was, that he really took to heart the idea that we should love our neighbors, really. Not just as some phrase or just as a, a thought, but to really put it into action. And, and it, it really was born out of a belief. Many of you guys know, some of you don't know, that Mr. Rogers went to seminary, made a decision whether he was going to be a pastor or whether he was going to allow his faith to preach in a different way. And he felt God leading the direction that we know him. But his faith foundation the truth and belief of what he acted out, the thing that really impacted the world, was based off what Jesus taught. Jesus taught in Matthew, and we'll be on the screen, Matthew 26, 22, 36 through 40. A teacher of the law was asking him, hey, what is the greatest command? There were 611 or 613 commands or, or rules or laws in the Torah, the first five books of the Old Testament where the law was given from God. There were 613 of them, and the religious leaders trying to trick Jesus. Okay, which one of those is more important than the other? And Jesus, in just, in just with such smooth style, came back with this answer. He said, Jesus replied, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, and your mind. And this is the first and greatest command. Then it says the second is equally important. Or in other translations, equally as the first. You love your neighbor as yourself. And then he continues to say, hang all the laws on these two commands. Love God, love others. Love our neighbor. We looked at that. If you missed last week, we started the series. I encourage you to go back and listen to last week's message and talk about what it really means to be a neighbor. Instead of looking for a neighbor love, how are we a neighbor? Some may say, and this is a question that I struggle with at points in my life, is do you, do you think Jesus is saying here that he's just dismissing all the other commands of the Old Testament. What about those? I mean, there is such things as the top 10, right? We know the top 10 commandments. Uh, you know, don't kill, don't steal, don't lie, don't want your neighbor's wife, don't want your neighbor's cow. You know, those, <laughs> don't what your neighbor has, honor your father, right? These commandments, does God just kind of throw, is Jesus saying, don't worry about these, just kind of sum it down to love? In fact, that's not what he's saying. And, and the scholars and religious people at the time were questioning him on that because he seemed to come and kind of almost buck the system. And, and see, the Jewish people had give, God had given them this law, and then they began to kind of 
add on to it and, and to say, you know, we don't want to break this law, so we're going we're gonna to push it a little bit farther out. So we never have to worry about breaking the law. We're going to make an extra law, all right? And so it's like, if I don't want to cross the street, I'm going to put a fence uh, for my kid. I want to cross the street. So I don't put the fence on the street. I put the fence like halfway in the yard because I don't even get close to it. And so the Jewish people began to almost have these oral traditions that became almost like law. And Jesus seems to be going, man, this is not what, this is what not religious scholars are saying. This seems different. Are you trying to throw away them? And then Jesus' first time kind of publicly speaking, it's called the Sermon on the Mount, as what traditionally it says. It was a, a message that when he stood up on a, mount, a hillside and, and preached is really his first message. Who is Jesus? What is his story? What is this rabbi teaching? This is what he says, Matthew chapter 5. And we, we learn what we call the Beatitudes, the happy are, the blessed are. And then he begins to talk about things that really for most people, and his audience was mainly Jewish, really just blew their mind because he was speaking things that were far deeper and, 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 and different than what they've been taught all their life. And so these religious leaders say, are, what, are you trying to do away with these laws that we have followed all our life? And we can see in Matthew chapter 5, that's kind of where we're going to stay today, Matthew chapter 5, just as Jesus talking, he says, don't misunderstand why I have come. You might be confused. I'm, I'm saying some things that are kind of radical. I'm saying things that you're not used to hearing. I'm saying things that are going to make you feel uncomfortable. I'm going to say things that religion has taught you all your life, and I'm going to say something different. But let me understand. Let me, don't, don't misunderstand me. Don't misunderstand when I come. He says, don't understand why I've come. I did not come to abolish the law of Moses or to overthrow, is what the Greek word really translates, to overthrow the law of Moses or the writings of the prophets. No, I have come to accomplish their purpose. The word accomplish their purpose is actually one Greek word, which means it, it almost has the idea of fulfill. In other translations, fulfill the law. The Greek word there honestly says it doesn't mean, it means to go beyond what's expected. It was an overflow. It's to go beyond what meeting it was. They said, I'm, gonna, I'm not here to throw away the law. I am here to fulfill the law. I'm here, and here's what he's really saying, I'm here to give you the deepest meaning of the law. You've heard it from prophets. You've heard it from your, your teachers. You've heard it from the Torah. You, you've heard these laws. I have come. I am coming to make this. I'm going to teach you the deepest part, why the law exists. Here is the real meaning. It goes far beyond just meeting or checking the expectation, right? Right? And, and so I, many of us, I didn't, I didn't grow up in religion in a sense, but I did where it really did focus on to do's and to don'ts. And if I just checked my marks on the to do's and the to don'ts, then I was okay. And that was the idea that we were meeting the law requirements. But what was the purpose of the law? Jesus says, I've come to fulfill it, to teach to you what the deepest, most intimate meaning of what the law was given for. And he goes on. He says, it goes a couple of verses later. I don't know if I have this, verse 20. But I warn you, he keeps talking about, well, unless you righteousness is better than the righteousness of the teachers of the law and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. That statement made a lot of people upset. If it didn't make them upset, it made them scared because these are the guys that you looked up to. These were the guys that had it all together. These were the ones that would say, they were religiously, man, they were the good people, Right? And, and Jesus says, look, if your righteousness is, doesn't surpass their righteousness, you're in trouble. And a lot of people, well, we're in trouble because I'm not as spiritual as the priest and the scribe and the Pharisee. I, I can't measure up. But what he was saying was, is not the law at its deepest is not a law of check marks. See, the Pharisee would go up to the expectation and then do things that were actually against people because he was saying that he was following the law. And Jesus gives another illustration another time. He says, look, you won't give and take care of your parents because you say, I'm dedicating this to the Lord, this money that I've had in my life. There was a, the thing that the Pharisees and the scribes and, and the people, the religious leaders say, look, I have this money saved, but you know what? I'm not going to give it to my parents, which is a command to honor thy father and to take care of my parents. I'm going to dedicate it to the Lord, and so I am free of the obligation of taking care of my parents. The letter of the law surpassed, in their mind, the love of the law. Because at its deepest, the law is a law of love. This is what he was trying to get at. It's not a check mark. They saw rules to follow. He wants to see a relationship to be fulfilled, 
a relationship to be fostered. In fact, it is if you think, take, take the top 10, right? The top 10, we, we know those commandments, right? If you look at the first four of the top 10, it is all about relationship and how you can love God. The last six of the top 10 are all about how you love and have relationship with others. When Jesus said you can hang all the laws of the Torah and the prophets on this, love God, love others. He really wanted to fulfill and help teach us that the letter of the law is not what I'm after. I'm after the heart of the law. I'm after the love of the law. The law was given to teach us and to guide us how we can truly love God and love others. This is his point. I come down to abolish it. There are some great guidelines and commands he's given us, but the ones he's given us are not to keep us in check and to, to push us down and to make us feel rejected. It is actually given to us to teach us the deepest heart of the law. Somebody, on a note, I asked at the beginning of the year, I asked you to write down different sermon or thoughts you'd like to discuss. One of you wrote, obey is better than sacrifice. It's an Old Testament reference when, when Saul doesn't wait on Samuel the prophet. And I'm going to kind of jump into a story, not long, but Samuel was the person who stood to do the sacrifice. Saul wouldn't wait on him. And Saul went ahead and did the sacrifice in the temple. And the prophet came and said, what did you do? He said, it's better to obey than sacrifice. What he was saying was, the letter of the law says you've got to make a sacrifice, but there's deeper, something deeper going on here. There's a heart issue going on. And so for you that wrote that, there you go. We check mark that off the list, all right? We talked about that. By the way, I've read every one that you wrote. I take them very seriously. We've got another series coming up probably in April on the Holy Spirit, which was one of the greatest ones that people wrote about. So we're interested there. So there we go. This is why Paul, so Jesus said, I have come to fulfill the law, to move it past the expectation of a checklist, to teach you the deeper meaning of all the laws. This is why Paul in Romans says this. He says this in Romans chapter 13, verse 8. You owe nothing to anyone except for your obligation to love one another. If you, listen to what he says. This is Paul. Paul sometimes gets a bad rap of being kind of ruthless sometimes, all right? Kind of mean, all right? He says, if you love your neighbor, you fulfill the requirement of the law. What he's saying is, if you understand that loving your neighbor is the exceeding the expectation, the deeper sense of what the law was about, then you fulfilled it when you love your neighbor. So at its core, it's this. It's not that I just miss all the other laws. Well, I can do what I want. I just got to love my neighbor. I can just do that. But here's the essence of the truth. That when I put myself into a place that I am here to love you, then by default, in that position of loving you, I frame myself in the moral law that God gave me. I will not cheat you. I will not steal from you. I will not lie to you. I will not, I will not commit adultery with your wife. I will, not, I will not murder you, right? These moral laws that God gave us really are something we don't have to work on. If I choose to truly love you, then the moral law around me is already in place, right? Y'all following me? So Jesus says, look, here is the heart of the law. Paul says, if you love your neighbor, you will fulfill the obligation of the law. Many of us have struggled all our life trying to check every mark on every part of the law. This is the wrong focus. The focus is, do I love God with all my heart and soul and mind, and do I love my neighbor as I love myself? If I pursue that wholeheartedly, then everything else will fall in place. Paul said this again. In Ephesians, he's talking to the church of Ephesus. He's trying to teach them. A lot of these people who knew the law grew up learning every one of those laws. In fact, by a young boy, most boys and some girls would know the entire Torah memorized. Come on now. I don't have that memorized. I got Genesis 1-1 done and I'm doing pretty good, all right? They, had the, they knew the law. Look what he says in Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 5, 13 and 14, he says this. For you've been called to live in freedom. Well, I say, you know what, man? You sound like you're talking about Jesus, and I can just do what I want, man. Jesus loves me, and I, I'm free to do whatever. Yeah, you are. God's love for you is not based on your actions, but 
If you truly understand the love that God offers you, then you will use this freedom not to satisfy your own sinful nature. Instead, you will use your freedom to serve one another in love. So here it is. Here's the truth. Blake's struggle with sin is not a control problem. It's a love problem. At its bottom core. I wish I could do better. I wish I could resist this. And look, I'm not talking about, there's addiction and there's things that come into us and we have help mentally and emotionally. But I can tell you that there is an element of every addiction and every struggle in life that is spiritual. Can, can, I, can you know that? Because you're not just a physical being. You're not just an emotional and mental being. You are a spiritual being at your core. And so at its core, when I struggle with sin, it's not a control point. I just got to do better. It is a love problem. I love myself in an unhealthy way more than I love my spouse, my friend, my neighbor, and God. Come on, like if we really were real, and we talk about all our struggles, we think about the struggles we have, we think I am not loving this other person because I'm choosing to love myself in an unhealthy way. Preach to me, right? Y'all agree? You agree? Yeah. So our sin struggle is a love problem. Jesus says, I have come to fulfill the law. I'm here to teach you and to model you what the law really is about. And it's about love. And then that's not enough. He gives four, he gives a couple, I don't, I have the list on here, but I can't remember. One, two, three, four, five, six. Six examples of laws that they would know and then teach us something deeper about them. When we don't have all the time to go through them, I'm just gonna breeze through the first five. First one is murder. Thou shalt not murder. Most of us in this room, and maybe not, but I hope so. And if so, we still love you and welcome you to Radius. We just wanna know, all right? You shall not murder. Everybody's like, check mark, not done that. I feel pretty good about myself. Then Jesus said, and he, he starts all, each of these phrases. You have heard your ancestors been, have been told which is, it's been passed down to you. A lot of our religious belief has been passed down. We've never searched it out for ourselves. Many of us have these ideologies and these Christian mythologies that we think are what God said, but never did God speak. And some people are never even coming to church and don't believe in God because they heard a mythology that you heard from someone else and you spoke it as truth. You need to be careful because what your ancestors or what somebody's told you is not truth. Where do you find truth? Because he said, you've heard your ancestors been taught this. And it says, then it says, you've heard that the law says. But then he says, Jesus says, but I tell you. Here's what you need to know on that little statement. We'll be done. Do not listen to me and let me be the final word. Do not listen to what your pastor or the person, your grandmother, or anybody says and gives you great little Christian faces that sound really spiritual. You need to know what Jesus said. Because Jesus will give you the clear interpretation and understanding of what is true and how we're meant to live. I can say that again. Do not let me, do not let me be the final inspiration or your final whatever. Do not let this person online be your final uh, truth. Do not let what you've heard all your life be your final truth. Don't let li li religion be your final truth. Let what Jesus said be defining of what you believe. If you go there, you're going to be shocked, you're going to be convicted, and you're going to be freed all in the same. And it's crazy. Right? Yeah. So he says, you've heard, you've heard them say, don't murder. But I tell you, your anger is just as destructive. What? <laughs> I feel good. I haven't murdered anybody. But you're telling me when I let the anger get the better of me, when I let loose and my anger just in controls me, that Jesus says, I'm breaking the deeper heart of the law. Because anger destroys relationships. He goes to the fact, he says, he says, this is crazy. Jesus says, say you're at the temple about ready to do a sacrifice, doing, going to church, we'll make it our monitors. Say you're at church and you're worshiping Jesus, all right? And you're, you're really worshiping, you're connecting with him. And then in your head, you remember somebody that you've done something against. He says, go leave the church right now. I know that's not what you're doing, Sophie, but uh, <laughs> that was perfect timing, man. <laughs> Everybody's like, did Sophie just hear that and got to go? <laughs> he said, leave your altar 
They leave your sacrifice at the altar, go and get right with the person and come back. Because what God's interested in is relationship with him and with others. That was a little longer, but anger. (laughs) Then he talks about adultery. And it's more than an act because it destroys relationship. Divorce. He talks about divorce because he says they were using it as just kind of a throwaway. If it's not working out, if it's getting difficult, the, they said the man would just write the divorce and they could just be separated. Divorce is a heavier thing. It is something that involves pain in her relationship. Don't take it lightly. And he says, your word is important. He talked about don't giving vows. In that time period, this is interesting, they would use phrases. Like we would say, I swear on my mother's grave, right? We use these colloquialisms to kind of, I'm really, I, what I'm always bad at, to, to tell you the truth. Like, was I not telling the truth before? That's the one I always use. You're probably going to hear it in a message. Just don't call me out because it's such a <laughs> habit. And I'm now convicted because it's what Jesus is talking about. <laughs> he says, don't, don't use by heaven. They, they would use these vows, like by heaven or by earth or by, they would use these special things to say, I'm really going to be honest with you now. And they had this thing that if they didn't use these, they could lie to you. I'll see you on Tuesday. And they didn't say by heaven or by earth, then you don't have to worry about it. And Jesus says, let your yes be yes and let your no be no. Why? Because he understands that relationships are hurt when our yeses aren't yes and our noes aren't noes. We live in a culture when it's convenient or yet we say yes until it gets inconvenient. <laughs> we live in a culture where our yes is there until it's not comfortable or something else comes up. God says, look, you don't understand what hangs in your yes and no's is relationship. It breaks, it hurts. We've all experienced that. Quit using these phrases. Just say what you mean and say it and be truthful. Amen. <laughs> then he talks about revenge. And we looked at that last week just for a moment. Talking about give your coat, walk the extra mile, and the phrase that we all hate to read in the Bible, turn the other cheek, and we can go there another time. But what he's really saying is this. He's saying, look, it's not your responsibility to take revenge. When you take it on yourself to get even or get back, you destroy a relationship. And then he ends with this. This is where everybody else, if you got along this far, I'm pretty good there, check my, and yeah, they're not too good, all right, all right. Here's where it gets all of us. Then he says in verse, verse 43, and notice, all of these are about relationships. He's teaching us that the law is a law of love, that the law at its deepest is relationship. You've heard it say, this is verse 43, you've heard it say, the law says, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Now, we've been talking about love your neighbor, and you're like, yes, got that. Hate your enemy? I do that pretty naturally, all right? I'm pretty good, all right? But I say, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. All right, we could just shut it down now because that's tough, right? When I think about the enemy, I'm talking about the one that that really does slap you in the face physically, emotionally, relationally. And let me make a little caveat here. If you're in an abusive relationship, that doesn't even mean you stay there. You need to get out. All right, I'm going to make that caveat because the truth of love is sometimes love is not staying but leaving. But at its core... When someone, my coworker, person hurts me, that enemy at work, y'all know him, you know that name right now that always pesters you, puts you down. Jesus says, you've heard say love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say, love your enemy, pray for them. And here's where it gets real, real. Why? Because they're a person. And their anger and their pain and their evil towards you is based out of some hurt within them. And if I can understand and I don't have to like it and I'm not excusing it and I'm not saying put yourself in a place where you just keep taking it, but you must understand and see them not as a person who's just out to hurt you, but a person who is hurting themselves. And I pray. He said, I pray all right. You want to know what I pray. (laughs) No, not that prayer. Pray for them. God, let them know how much you love them. See, hurt people hurt people. Broken people try to break other people. 
we can get so hurt that we say they're an enemy and I'm going to do whatever it takes to get them back. But she says, no, no. Love them. And keep reading. Because you'll be acting like the true children of God. The world wants to know what's true. You say this is truth and they say this is truth and this is truth. Jesus says, you want to know why you know what's truth? Look for the ones that love the ones that will never get anything back to them, the ones that actually hurt them. You see those loving, you're going to seek truth because that's the true children of God. For he gives sunlight to both the evil and the good. And he sends rain on the just and the unjust alike. If you love those who only love you, what reward is that? Everybody does that. I get that. You scratch my back, I scratch yours. You help me, I help you. But Jesus says it's deeper than that. You want to be a true disciple? Don't live that way. Even corrupt tax collectors, even the IRS does that. (laughs) We're probably going to get audited now that's some video. (laughs) If you're kind only to your friends, how different are you from anyone else? Even pagans do that. Even the ones that say there is no God will love the person that's their friend. But Jesus says, love them all. And look at the last verse. 48, which I'd probably told you not to put in there, Cassie. Cassie's like, you didn't tell me that verse. <laughs> is, is it in there? You know what? I, you know I could do? The one thing I should have done from the beginning is actually open the Bible. It's up. I'm still going to read it from the scripture now. It's right there. We can sit there and look at that for a second. Here's the last verse because it's pretty heavy. But you are to be perfect even as your Father in heaven is perfect. (laughs) How? And thus we come to the second purpose of the deep law of love. The law was there to tell you and show you that you can't. Romans 3. Obviously, this is t- Paul talking. Obviously, the law applies to those who it was given. For his purpose is to keep people from li- having excuses, to show that the entire world is guilty before God. In another passage, Paul says that the law was given as a teacher to show us that we can't fulfill the law. We will always fall short. In fact, just a couple of verses later, we keep reading. It says, for no one can ever be made right with God by doing what the law commands. Because you can't keep it. Be perfect like I am perfect. Love your enemy at all times. Love. You can't do it on your own. But now God has shown us a way to be made right with him without keeping the requirements of the law. As we've promised in the writings of Moses and the prophets long ago. Verse 22. We are made right with God by placing our faith in Jesus Christ. And this is true for anyone who believes no matter who we are are. This is the good news. He didn't dismiss the law. No, we need to love our neighbors. We need to love our enemies, but we cannot do it on our own. In fact, here's the truth that Jesus says. I am come not only to fulfill it, to teach you what the deeper part is. I am the one that's going to take and actually complete the law. I'm going to do everything the law says, and I'm going to take my righteousness and completing every law of perfection, and I'm going to give it to you if you just trust in me. I will pay for your sin, your brokenness. I will, the Bible says, and he had to fulfill every law. The law said there is punishment for sin, death for sin. This was a law. And so Jesus said, I will take even that law, and I will die on a cross, and I will take your death and my death that we deserve because we have broken the law. He will take it. And then he will say, I will then give you my righteousness. I will give you what you cannot earn. The only way you do that is not trying to fulfill the law or being a good person. It is by asking and realizing I can. Which when I said be perfect like Jesus is perfect or God's perfect, everyone in here said, honestly, I can't do that. And you're right. And that's the point that Jesus wants us to get to. You aren't enough. You can't do it on your own. You are loved for who you are. You don't have to be any more or any less for his love. But to be made right, it takes one thing, the blood of Jesus Christ that he paid for. And he doesn't ask you to fulfill all these laws to get it. He says, just realize and believe and ask for it. And I'm willing to give it to you freely. Maybe you're coming to church today because you feel so guilty of what you did Saturday. 
or what you felt all your life. Here's the good news. You don't have to come to church for that. Jesus says, I have forgiven you. I've paid for it. I want relationship with you. Ask, and I'll give it. Literally, right now, think about that. Right now in your seat, everything can be forgiven. Your life made perfect. Not that you'll have an easy, perfect life ever, but you will made free. The sin curse will be off of you. You can do it right there, right now, by just asking him. This is what the scripture says. We can't fulfill the law. I'm not going to tell you, go out and read your Bible 10 times a day. Go this, check this, check this list, and then maybe God will be okay to open you in the pearly gates. That's not it. The good news is I don't have to live on pins and needles. I don't have to live with that tension. Jesus said, I have taken it all. I have forgiven you. I paid for it on the cross. And the only thing I ask for you is to ask and believe and ask me for this forgiveness, and I will give it to you. I will accept seed the law. The law says you just measure up. Jesus says I measure past. I, I went past the law. I give you what the law can never give you and that's forgiveness and perfection in him. Woo-hoo! That gets me excited. That brings up some old Baptist roots in me, man. I'm about ready to kick something, right? You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Come on. Freedom in Jesus is not feeling guilty for everything you fall short. It's just realizing that you are not being satisfied because God did not say get done with it. You can do what you want. But to realize I can't be what God's called me to be. I need him. This is the deepest meaning of the law. And that type of love, when we can receive that type of relationship, because here's the truth. When I, when I understand God's love for me, then I can love the enemies around me. I'm going to say that one more time. When I understand God's love for me, because believe it or not, the Bible says at one point we were all enemies of God. God loved his enemy, me. When I understand God's love for me, through him, I have the power to love those around me. And that type of love will change the world. We end with this verse and we're done. 1 John 4. This summer, by the way, you don't want to skip out on radius this summer. We're going to go through the 12 disciples. We're going to look at each one. We're going to look at their stories. We're going to look at what even tradition says because we've all heard their names, but some of you know their name. It's all you know. There's so much richness in learning these lives, these 12 men that followed Jesus. We're going to learn all summer, each week, a different disciple. So come join us. But John who wrote this, was the only apostle standing at the foot of the cross with Jesus' mother. He, and early on, and we'll talk about this summer, John was a ruthless, mean guy. He wanted to call down fire on the town because they dissed him. All right, this is John. John's like, Jesus, call down fire on those guys. They may be mad, right? This is John. He was, we can't, I can't spoil it all. But John stood at, the fall, stood at the cross and his life was changed. John, who was known to being angry became the known as the person of love. And when he wrote 1 John, he gave the definition and the, the best uh, display of what love is. He says in 1 John 4, he says, dear friends, let us continue to love one another for love comes from God. And anyone who loves is a child of God and knows God. But anyone who does not love does not know God for God is love. God showed how much he loved us by sending his one and only son into the world so that we might have eternal life through him. This is real love. Not that we love God, but that God loved us. And his son, and sent his son as a sacrifice to take away our sins. Dear friends, since God loved us that much, we surely ought to love one another. You hear it? If I understand what God's love for me really is and took, then I can love the ones that I deem unlovable. Keep going back. Verse 12. (laughs) This is all me. Cassie's on it today. It ends with saying this. And you should go home and read it. That's your homework. It says this. When we love this way, it says no one's ever seen God. But when we love like this, we bring full expression to who God is when we love. Come on. Jesus says, no one's ever seen God. I wish I could say, hey, Jesus, appear right here. And everybody, ooh, I believe, I'm good, I'm golden. He says, you know how I make it a full understanding of who God is? It's how I love like he loves, unconditionally. 
That's the love that will impact the world. And that's why every one of us needs to do something this week in Love Week. Something. Because there's something that's deeper than just the act of the hugs to give out to the neighbor. There's something deeper going on. Because God is love, and I believe with him all my heart, and this is the core value of Radius, that when I love, I am a conduit for God to touch people. When I love, I'm a conduit for God to touch people. I'm not here to convince people there's a God. You would think I would be. That's a pastor, right? My here ultimate job is to display the reality of God and how I act. My job as a Christian, as a follower of him, is allow my life to be a conduit for God's love in the actions that I portray. And when I don't, I am breaking the law. Amen? Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for this day. God, we all fall short. I first want a moment, just a silence, and maybe a little music playing softly. If there's anyone in here that has tried and tried to do what's right and tried to follow the rules, but just never felt like they measured enough, came to church and felt like they didn't fit, didn't think that God really loved them, can I tell you today that God's love for you is great. It was so great, he died for you. And what he offers you right now is forgiveness. And how do I receive that? With a conversation. Just talk to him. Right now you see, he is listening. He knows your life. He knows your story. He loves you. You can throw away the religion and embrace the relationship. Just say something like this, Jesus. In your seat, you can just call it Jesus. I need you. Forgive me of my sin. You know I fall short. And I've tried so hard to be good, but I always seem to fall short. So forgive me. I put my faith in you. I believe that you died for me. And I want a relationship with you. If you prayed that right now, if you just said those words, that's what a prayer is, just talking to God. Then you, Jesus says that he hears your prayer. He forgives you. And he invites you into relationship with him forever. Man, like that day, say that I just did that. I just prayed. I just talked to God. I confessed to Him, and I invited Him in a relationship. Just slip your hand up real quick, and there were no one else looking around. And say that that was me. I did that today. See a hand. Awesome. Anybody else to say I did that? I took that step. If you raise a hand, I see you. I want you to see me after Gavin, will you? I want to give you something. I will help you in your journey as you walk with Jesus. And finally, for you who say, I know Jesus. I'm trying to follow him. Just take a moment and embrace the law of love. Ask him, Lord, help me. Love my neighbors. Love my enemies. Love the ones that slap me. Love the ones that hurt me, the ones who have betrayed me. Because I know, God, you will, you will handle what you need with them. But what you require of me is to pray for them, to treat them with kindness, whether they deserve it or not. Right now in your seat, just ask him for that help. Lean into his love for you to fuel you to love others. Lord, we love you so much. We know and we see and we hear how much you love us. But God, we, for, we fall short so many times even remembering that. May it move us. May it move us to action. May we walk out of here today thinking of ways to love others, to be a conduit of love they can encounter you. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.